So the great thing about Star Trek is that it's episodic, which means that, like, if you miss a couple episodes, you can just jump in and, you know, not really need to know what's going on. Uh, for example, I didn't watch any of last week's episodes, and I'm just going to be able to know exactly what's happening. Uh, for example, oh, yeah. we seem to be in a board cube. Uh-huh. Wait, what? Yeah. So we, uh, we, we did a, a little heist mission where we, uh, we stole some isodesium from the, uh, the scavengers who previously stole stuff from us. Okay. And then the... And then the Borg showed up, and they stole it. Where's the last guy? Okay, on the one hand, I'm not sure I understood that, but on the other hand, uh, some of those weren't real words, so you can understand it. So, it, really, I'm fine. Yeah. I'm doing A-okay. So that's a scripted thing. Uh, oh, no. Oh, God. Yeah, he's hurt bad. <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> All right, well, uh, I hope he recovers. Yeah, so the Borg jacked our stuff. Also, they took Foster, and uh, and they tried to assimilate him, but we saved him, and uh, he's definitely going to show up again. Ah, jeez. It's so, not fair for you to drop in right in front of me. Are there any natural-born Borg? Uh, yes. Like, are actually, they humans uh, that are born and immediately transformed into Borg? Or well, like probably not humans so much, but yeah. You know, like uh, some assimilated host species are reproduced and then they're immediately borgified and put in maturation chambers so they grow up real fast. This is actually covered in the very first episode where the Borg show up. Yeah, so now we've got a little wave defense thing here where the board beam in and uh so they replenish their numbers but they're not like yes there's there's no like organic board what do you mean well it's not like there's like a core origin species of borg it's like some humans eventually i mean there st might staple but some tech to themselves point, and then it became a tech like, virus yeah, at this point, like, you know, there's so many Borg species that, you know, who knows how many of them are the original race that became the Borg first. I appreciate that that seems like, not to be They've it. never explored the, the exact origin. Uh-oh. I respect that, because that's that seems like the sort of thing where if it was Star Wars, that would have been, like, a novel decades ago. Nice dive, Chang. Stop running in front of me, you idiots! <laughs> what are these people doing? Look, this is Star Force, Star Starfleet's elite force. This is the best they got. Yeah. And elite. and it turns out that when your entire civilization is a largely non-warfaring, pretty peaceful organization, the best you got isn't very good. Yeah, they're not so much using tactics as they are, like, birthday party laser tag, where you don't actually know any of the other people on your team. God, I miss birthday parties and laser tag and stuff. When was the last time you went to laser tag? I don't think I've ever done laser tag. I just miss being able to go do stuff. <laughs> Rutskarn's little birthday party story made me miss being able to go have fun. God damn it. The last time I did laser tag, uh, there was a dad who was using his own child as a human shield in, in a sniper nest and who was racking well, up consistently the highest innovative. score yeah it was uh, I'll give you this much it was a new tactic I mean my, my problem is that like laser tag always felt a little too arbitrary because you can never see the beam so it's just like your thing starts blinking red and you're dead and like you don't know who hit you or from where or how you screwed up but and I so I always yeah, wanted yeah. something more tactile real guns are nothing but, like that. <laughs> well, but, like, I wanted something more tactile, but if you move up to the next level up, it's, like, paintball guns, and uh, that actually the, leaves impact, and I don't want to do that. That's no. physical. Uh, I, I don't know what the technology's at now, but the last time I did it, there was basically an LED uh, display on the gun itself that would tell you who you've hit and who has hit you.
Is this technically a Jeffrey's tube, or is that only on Starfleet ships? I don't know. I mean, maybe they got the idea from Starfleet. You mean from Jeffries? This is, this is a Giffrey's tube. Well, M Matt Jeffries was the designer of the original Enterprise, which is where the name comes from. But they say Jeffries tube on the show, so it's canonical. Yeah, so presumably there is a real Star Trek real Matt Jeffries who came up with crawl spaces. I'm going to check memory alpha. I don't remember what the... Uh-oh. Goodbye, Chang. <laughs> Goodbye, Chang. Usually they jump down. Oh, no, here he comes. All right, well, he just landed on my head, so he's probably fine. I can't tell if Chris is asking genuine questions anymore or if he's just... <laughs> I don't know. Like, there's been some wild questions where I thought you were joking and you were serious, so now I'm, like, very cautious about approaching your questions. <laughs> I, I, I'll shut up. I'm sorry. I didn't. I didn't no, even... I'm not telling you to shut up. I, I just, I'm just trying to fill dead air. If anybody has anything else to say, th this is my third <laughs> week watching this, and I don't have a ton Can else I to make this jump. Yes. Sooner or later, we'll get. I to absolutely this can make that jump. So they definitely do have like. A swarming thing going on, like as their tactic. Yeah. So we talked about how cool that was, but I have to say that I'm not sure it really endures with this many levels. I don't know. Do you feel like they're coming at you from uh, like exciting enough angles that it's it's keep kept interesting? It, like it definitely feels like they're they're swarming. Like in the in the actual in the moment, like oh god, they're behind me, they're in front of me. Like yeah, um, it's not particularly difficult because. This game is not particularly difficult, but, um, of course, we're only playing on normal difficulty, so I'm sure a harder difficulty might be different, but, um, but it does feel like it's, it's an interesting thing, and it's different from the way, like, the Scavengers fought, for example. Oh, another thing that, that this game does really well for its time period is, uh, companion NPCs. I got a bunch of NPCs following me around that are shooting, and... They do get in the way sometimes, but they're not, like, the horrible garbage that was, like, other contemporary shooters where you have NPC companions running around and they would yeah, like, just die or be useless or do <laughs> stupid stuff or get caught on geometry. That is not quite yet a solved problem. Yeah, I feel like, like, Half-Life 2, by the time it came around with, like, Alex during many of the levels, like, that was pretty much when it was fixed, but it, I don't remember other games from that time period, so I don't know, maybe it was it was already kind of a solved thing then. Okay, so... Yep, they do just have W.M. Jeffries, which is the real name of Matt Jeffries. Uh, as a Starfleet officer in the 22nd century in Star Trek. Okay, let's move out, people. Right. They also do a lot of, like, Easter eggs with, like, the, the dedication plaques will list a bunch of, like, people who were involved in the development and building of the ship. And it's all just, like, you know, the, the lead writers and the producers and stuff. Why is there a bomb that I could just blow up right here? Are, there, are, there, are Borg gonna pop in behind us? Is that what's gonna happen? I'm waiting. The Borg are testing your id. <laughs> it, it's certainly frightening, like kind of the, their their voice, like the the harsh hisses of things screeching open. Yeah, they also move faster than. Uh... The Borg tended to move in the show for the purposes of there's no act not just totally worthless. Because <laughs> there's no actors buried under all of that. Yeah. Um, and also for the show, you mean, I mean, you didn't have sets this large, so you had to, you know, I mean, the best of both worlds, there was just one set, and it was basically just like a cross corridor, <laughs> and, you know, like, you know five meters to a side and you know the board would come around and they'd shoot them and then the board would come around another corner and they'd shoot them and have a few of those this is the Plus, only spot yeah. in this level where you have to use a different gun 
Plus, Picard would rarely zip around with the speed and maneuverability of a Ducati motorcycle. <laughs> There's a scene in, in The Best of Both Worlds at the end of, I think, the first episode where they, like, Picard, you know, they show Picard assimilated for the first time and Worf goes up to, to grab him and runs into a force field, but very clearly, like, his his prat falling was done at an angle, so the force field looks all angled and wrong. I guess I didn't want to do another take. Excuse me. Are we gonna? There we go. The the one annoying thing the NPCs do is they uh, they get really mouthy with you if you're standing in their way, um, and they will repeatedly ask you to get out of the way. Like, Seven only says, excuse me, but, like, Chang goes, GET OUT OF MY WAY! And <laughs> this really, like, desperate voice when you're wandering around on, like, Voyage or whatever. It's pretty amusing. I mean, probably not so much when he does it, but... Oh, yeah, um... It's especially annoying because when they're yelling at you to do that, they often don't really have a clear purpose in mind. Like, they don't have a necessary objective they're attempting to accomplish. Yeah. They just kind of figure they might meander over there that way and see what botting is to be done. I said it is really odd that the Borg levels are some of the easiest because the iMod is, you know, one alt fire shot kills a Borg. And even with guns, these Borg aren't doing things like trying to take cover or anything. They're just walking up to you, so... It's funny how the Ultimate Evolved Organism actually kind of sucks ass. Well, if you had to play it with, like, balancing your shots and stuff, or the iMod wasn't a thing, and you had to play it with them adapting to your weapons gradually, that would make it more interesting. Would you get on the damn elevator, please? Come on, I can't go without you. I'm seriously freaking out here. There. They all get on and the elevator goes up without you. <laughs> I was expecting that to happen, actually. See, they would, they would do that now that I've been singing the praises of the AI companions in this video game, is make them act like complete doofuses. So I gotta say, this is one of the, the least good ep levels, I almost called it an episode, so far. Um, mostly just because it's all one note. Like like the stealthy air level, where we had like the mustache people, that was cool. And it was like next to the old Klingon the ship. The mustache people? The, the near universe the mustache. People. Oh. I, I'm intrigued. I don't know what to call people from the alternate universe, the evil universe. <laughs> like... <laughs> they never named it. Oh, in some areas, there's some kind of proximity thing going on with the Borg, I think. Or it's just a weird bug, but whenever I jump, there's the sound of Borg activating. And only when I jump. <laughs> well, stop jumping, you're activating them! <laughs> Those are just the hydraulic leg implants we gave you, it's fine. <laughs> After you fell and broke your legs. I find it a bit odd that the NPCs were having trouble getting on the elevator, though. That seems elementary. Like, yeah, stack up it, on it, this it, elevator... It, it gets worse in the next level, where there's a, a brief bit where there's, like, six people. Like, do they not have the time to put, like, down a couple coordinates, just, like, stand on that when the player's ready to engage the elevator? Yeah, I don't know. Um, so, the the Borg have temporarily taken control of Seven of Nine. I believe if Foster is not saved, he shows up here instead of Seven being taken control of. Also, I will point out that uh, this is another bit of Voyager making the Borg kind of lame, where uh, the, initial, the Borg were initially introduced as these sort of, you know, almost 
insect hive mind kind of thing um, with incredibly redundant chips, and now we've got the uh, the vinculum, the central processor for all the the Borg, you know, hive signals. It's basically the the big Wi-Fi router at the center of the Borg cube. Oh, also, Species A four seven two is here. Who is that? Is that the Borg Queen? N no, A four seven two is from the Voyager episode where the Borg are getting their asses kicked by a species they can't assimilate from a different universe in a place called fluidic space. Figure out how that works. Oh, okay. So they want us to clear out Species A472 for them, and then they'll give us the Isodesium, which sounds like something they totally won't renege on. Well, we should ask for half up front and half on delivery. <laughs> Alright, so now we're not fighting Borg, so it's better to switch to our weapons that are actually really good. Now that's interesting that they put the Isodesium in an area that's already been infested by Species A472, given that they stole it like three hours ago. And, uh... And I, I guess, did A472 spread from where they were to go take the Isodesium, or did they just, like beam it to some place they knew was already taken by A472. I don't know, maybe that was explained in the uh, the bit of dialogue we missed there, but... Have you answered, actually, when did you first play this game? Um, not too long after it came out. So, that that's Species 8472. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the one time that we run into one of these guys, well, there's several times when we run into Species 8472 in, in Voyager, but the first time we run into them, one individual almost killed Harry Kim by slapping him once, and they were incredibly difficult to actually kill. But now, and now they're just kind of a mob. Now we have the minigun. I always thought that's what the Federation needed. More firepower. Oh, they got it. We covered that in the last episode with the bazookas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Worf's purple space bazooka. Mm -hmm. That is canon. That is canon. The canon can. <laughs> the canon cannon should be able to fire at things and then make them official. <laughs> It's, it's like a universe that's basically Calvin Ball and anything goes until something is hit by the cannon oh, look, cannon, and then that can no longer be changed, and you're slowly building up a fictional concrete cannon <laughs> from this entire possibility space of cannon. Bunch of unimportant weapon energy stations. Oh, there's a uh, new Huh. Several of them. Yeah, but it doesn't actually kill anyone. It, it only solidifies whatever you fired on in a blast area. So, for example, you have, like, someone else use small arms, and then, like, there's a superimposed death and not death, and then you fire the cannon cannon to collapse the wavelength. Wave so it's kind of an anti-multiverse gun. Now I'm wondering if you could, like, make a story generation game that sort of is based around, like, setting certain events in stone by officially declaring them canon by playing your cards against other people's cards and then having a resulting story that is generated from events that you come up with. This is actually... I yeah, was... I've, I've played uh, games like that, actually. Oh, cool. There's a game that's similar, which is interesting, but, like, it has a mechanic for that kind of thing, uh, which is called Microscope. Oops. 
And the premise of Microscope is that instead of like telling one story, you basically collaboratively create a very large scale timeline of like a world or setting. You define like what is the beginning of the setting and what is the end of the setting. Like Magicka appears, heat death of the universe. And then you collaboratively fill in periods and then events and then scenes within those events. And there's a mechanic for like when two people disagree on something in a scene, like disagree on a setting detail that's being established canonically. There's like kind of a roll off to determine whose version is canon. Also, uh, the LARP that a friend of mine and I developed uh, had a, a mechanic where essentially it like if you tell someone something or you you you, you can say whatever you want about the, the world or like what's happened or what you're doing, but people don't actually have to agree that's true. And the only mechanics are for sort of like getting people to agree, okay, this is canon as far as my character is concerned. That's pretty so it's not like so it's not like uh, I'm using this mechanic to defeat you in a duel. It's like, I told you I defeated you in a duel, and I'm using this mechanic to convince you that that's true. See, that sounds cool. It, it got interesting when there were ideological wars involved, because people would have very different, like, very different timelines of what had happened in the past, like with your nation, with your people, and then also very different timelines about what had happened in the recent past, like... Uh, no, I think that you're the one who assassinated the Duke last week. <laughs> Wait, you tried uh, to negotiate with the fucking board? We had plan. Chang dropped a very small bomb. Oh no, the Wi-Fi router's been blown up. 